Okay, welcome everyone. We are very happy to have Ryan Thorgan today in uh, in our seminar series. And uh, so Ryan uh, uh, is a uh, is a high energy condensed matter physicist, but also has a PhD in math. So he's a uh, he's all over the place. And today he's going to tell, tell us about uh, high berry phase and diabolical points. Please, Ryan. Thank you. Um, yes, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. And looks like this is a pretty intimate seminar. I mean, I know we're on recording, but uh, there's not many of us actually here. So please, like, um, we can take this in any direction you'd like. If, you, if you'd like to ask questions, uh, feel free to interrupt. And yeah, so I'll, I'm going to try to tell you about um, this topic of higher berry phase that is that has been dear to my heart for a while. I think um, the f my first encounter with the subject was here's some bibliography of my papers. I think my first encounter with the subject was actually studying crystalline phases brought us into this realm. So this paper with Dominic, but most, mostly I'm going to tell you about, about this work with, with Poshen and Anton about higher berry phase from a effective field theory point of view. And then may maybe if I, I have time, I'll talk about um, these recent works where we give some more lattice flavor construction of interesting families with a uh, higher berry phase. So the slogan here is that we want to study systems and families and we want these families to be nice. Like um, for instance, a family where every system has the same infrared fixed point or a family that is a uh, all of the nearby phases of a fixed point. We want to associate some topological invariance to these families using effective field theory. And the goal is to try to understand what a generic phase diagram looks like and using these topological invariants to figure out global constraints on these shapes. So I'm gonna start off by reviewing, reviewing uh, the quantum mechanical Berry phase. It's a very well-known subject. But hopefully, we'll frame it in a way that makes it clear how we can generalize to higher berry phase, uh, which applies in many body systems. And then a novelty of going beyond zero dimensions is now we can consider boundaries. And there are interesting boundary phenomena associated to higher berry phase. And there's even a bulk boundary correspondence, which I'll explain. And then I'll talk a little bit about how you include symmetries in the story, the global symmetries, and that connects us to subjects like and... the Taoist charge pump. And uh, I don't know if there's a question already. I don't know. And then a little bit about a classification of, of the um, effective field theories that uh, capture these things. And then maybe if we have time, I'll get into this construction of, of interesting families on the lattice. Okay, so Berry phase is, it's a quantized adiabatic response of our system as a function of system parameters. So there's also Berry phase um, in band theory where you consider how the uh, like free fermion states depend on momentum here, I want to consider berry phase as a function of external parameters. So the paradigmatic example of that is a spin one half in a magnetic field. So this is a, this is a two state system. So the Hilbert space is this two dimensional space. And there's, um, we want to consider Hermitian matrices acting on this space. And there's a three real dimensional space of them, which is spanned by these three Pauli matrices sigma x, sigma y, sigma z. It's not really important what these are. It's just important that there are three of them. And then we can consider, um, then we can consider this Hamiltonian where we choose some parameter h. I don't think I said what h is. So h, like h is some element of R3. And to that element, we define, um, we define this Hamiltonian by just dot product with this vector. So this is a two by two matrix. And for H non-zero, any H non-zero 
there's going to be a unique smallest uh, uh, eigenvalue, right? So there's going to be a unique ground state of this of this uh, Hamiltonian, and we can compute it. And it only depends on if, if we if we look at uh, spherical coordinates here, or h, where we have theta going from zero to uh, two pi will be the uh, latitude, and then phi will be the longitude from zero to two pi. And then we can then we can express this this ground state uh, like so in the in the sigma z basis. Sometimes I'll just write x y z. And you see this uh, this expression is um, it's good everywhere except the south pole of this sphere. When we have when we have theta equals pi, then this term is going to be zero. This term is going to be e to the minus i phi, but phi is not defined at the poles, right? The, the longitude is not defined at the poles, so this is this is not smooth there, but it's smooth everywhere else. Well, it's not really a problem. If we want to express the ground state uh, at the South Pole, we can, we can exploit this fact that the, we're only really interested in ground states up to phase factors. So if we simply take our ground state um, psi and multiply by e to the i phi, then we've moved this phase factor over. And then this is going to be good at the South Pole, right? because this term is just going to be 0. But now it's not going to be good at the North Pole for the same reason. And it's a, uh, you can convince yourself, it's actually impossible to find a ground, a smooth ground state everywhere, everywhere that there's a unique ground state. So in other words, everywhere except the origin. And really what we want to say is that these two, these two uh, ground states, which are really the same, they form a section of a line bundle. So there's, there's a line bundle that has two patches on like everything but the South Pole and everything but the but the North Pole, and this e to the i phi is the gluing function. And you see e to the i phi has winding number one. So this uh, ground state is a section of a line bundle on the sphere uh, with turn number one. So the Berry phase comes from studying a connection on this bundle. And we can define it in terms of, in terms of our uh, local expressions for the ground state, psi, um, just by forming this forming this inner product with the derivative. Okay, so here h is our parameter. So we take, we take derivatives in the parameter coordinate. So this defines a, this locally defines um, some one form on the parameter space. And if we look at how, how, uh, how it transforms when we, when we exploit this phase ambiguity of the ground states, if we rotate the phase by some parameter dependent function, B shifts like a connection form. So it defines a connection. And for this uh, example that I just showed you, the spin one half, it's actually the same as the vector potential of a magnetic monopole located at the origin. So that's something you can show. And it, uh, it has this nice um, curvature in the, in the radial direction. And you see that the integral of the curvature is over any sphere around the origin is going to be two pi, right? So that's another way to see the churn number. And we think about this point at the origin, which is called a diabolical point, because you have uh, you have two states meeting, but it's also sort of uh, devilish, I suppose. Um, it's somehow it's like the monopole. It's like the source of the Berry curvature, somehow. And actually, this uh, this churn number shows us that we can't get rid of this point at the origin. There's, there's no way to get rid of it, which is kind of funny, right? Like if we, if we draw the phase diagram of the system, so we draw uh, a picture in, in H space, which is R3, there's just going to be a single two, double degeneracy at some point in this space. And we might think this looks totally not generic. We should be able to do some perturbation and get rid of this. but Actually, you can't get rid of it. And for, for a very small perturbation, it's easy to see that just because the Hamiltonian includes in it all of the two by two matrices. So for a very small perturbation, you can actually undo the
the perturbation by diffeomorphism, it just moves this point around a little bit. But more generally, if you do a larger perturbation, you might create more diabolical points, but the rule is you'll only ever create them in pairs of opposite churn number. So we might have a situation like this. And the reason that is, is because for a perturbation that is not blowing up at infinity, or maybe that is decaying to zero at infinity, on some large enough sphere, this connection you know, could be changed a little bit, but the churn number can't jump. And so the churn numbers inside have to add up because this big sphere is homologous to all of the little spheres around each of these diabolical points. This is kind of a version of the intermediate value theorem. If you, if you like, if you have a, a real function of a single variable, which goes from minus infinity to infinity, there's a single zero at the origin and small variations in the function move the zero around. Big variations can create zeros, but sort of in opposite signed pairs where the, where the index is, is uh, whether it's going down to up or up to down. And this is kind of like the matrix uh, version of this. Okay, so this is what we want to do. We want we want to now uh, look for look for diabolical points in in the phase diagrams of many body systems, and use things like Berry phase to give these kinds of topological constraints, like saying that the points are stable, or you can only create them in pairs. Statements like that are what we're interested in. So physically, you can you encounter the Berry connection. So I gave you a sort of abstract uh, definition of it, but you can, you can physically encounter it in the adiabatic expansion. So what we want to do is we want to let our parameters depend on time. So I'm going to say, I'm gonna call sigma this thing that depends on time and say that uh, the parameter H is going to be equal to this function of time. And then if you have time varying parameters, you have a time varying Hamiltonian, you can, you can compute transition amplitudes using this uh, path ordered exponential of the Hamiltonian, where we start with the ground state, say it's a path, we start with the ground state at the initial point of the path, and then we, we look at the, the um, transition amplitude to the ground state at the end of the path. And we can just say that the log of that defines something that we'll call the effective action of sigma. And the idea is that if the energy gap is bounded from below. So if we're not going arbitrarily close to this diabolical point, if we're sort of maybe along some sphere of some fixed radius or something like that, we expect that there's a good expansion of this effective action in terms of, in terms of functionals of sigma, integrals of functions of sigma and its derivatives, which is sort of order by order in the derivatives. So if we let sigma be very slowly varying with respect to the gap, we expect that the most important contributions, the largest contributions to this quantity are given by the ones with the smallest number of derivatives of sigma. And so if you just look at what sort of terms appear in the adiabatic expansion, the first one depends on, so this will be some b, with some function of sigma, but not of its derivatives. And the only place that the derivative will appear is maybe a single derivative. And a term like this is, is, is uh, topological. So here x is, is like the world line of the system, if you like. And so we can eliminate T and just express this as, um, as the pullback of this form B. And so we recognize this is exactly, this is exactly the very connection. And so the very, the very connection here is the first term in the adiabatic expansion. So you see it as, as the variation of the phase of the ground state as you slowly vary it. Okay, so this is a term, this is a term in the effective action. And you can sort of think of it as a Wessemina Witten term. So if if X if X is the boundary of some surface, so X is it's a one manifold, if X is the boundary of some surface and sigma extends to this surface, then because because B has churn number one, DB is the volume form on S2. And we can re-express this as an integral over the bounding surface now. 
of the pullback of the volume form, which is one of these Wessumina Witten terms that you're probably familiar with. So we're going to we're going to use that to construct higher dimensional examples. So here's here's the recipe. So we're going to start with a system um, can be in any number of dimensions with a parameter space, and we want to choose a subset of the parameter space where the system is well behaved. So in the quantum mechanical example, this was away from the diabolical locus, maybe sort of away from a neighborhood of the diabolical points, so that the gap is uh, uniformly bounded from below. And in this talk, we're, we're, I'm only going to be talking about uh, systems in the trivial phase. So maybe it'll be like a subset of the parameter space where the system flows to a trivial phase, although you could do this in general. And then we're going to couple to background fields for the parameters and integrate out the original degrees of freedom, form this effective action. All, right. All I mean is we define this effective action as some log of a partition function. And then we're going to look for topological terms which could appear here. Topological terms such as this with the Mina Witten term. And then wonder about what this says about our system. So here is sort of a proof of concept where uh, you kind of build, if you start with a nonlinear sigma model with a WCW term, we can certainly get a theory um, with a higher Berry connection. And that, that works like this. So, so we're going to consider a sigma model uh, where the target space is a d plus two sphere here, little d is the space dimension. So we're in d plus one dimensions. X is our space time manifold. And we're going to consider an, an action like this, which has the spherical symmetry, but it's not really important, where we have some stiffness and we have, uh, we have maybe a polarizing field. So this is going to play the role uh, H here is some uh, d plus three vector. It's going to play the role of the magnetic field in the quantum mechanical Berry phase. So we're going to study this um, as a function of these two parameters, but mostly of this parameter H. And K is, um, is an integer. This is the level of this Wessemino Witten term. So this term this term, you need to, again, you need to, you need to choose a d plus two manifold z whose boundary is space time. And we also want, uh, you know, we also, we also want the map phi to extend to z. And we might not be able to choose this data um, for general target spaces, uh, things like that. The better, the better way to talk about this term, which will connect it to this uh, very connection, is to think about it as the holonomy of, of a connection on this d plus two sphere. And well, it won't be, it won't be like the usual sort of connection that, that we're used to in gauge theory, it'll be like a higher form connection. So more, more similar to a B field, more similar to the B field in string theory or the C field you know, there's, there's a notion of uh, U1 gauge field with arbitrary form degree. And the definition is sort of inductive. You can, you can give an inductive definition very briefly. The, we'll say, and so this, is, this, is, uh, this is our definition, which we won't really use, but uh, a P form U1 connection, it's a, it's a collection of ordinary P forms on some fine enough open cover, maybe an open cover by contractible opens. So we'll call these uh, B sub J, such that on the overlaps, so these uh, on these pairwise intersections of, of our opens, that the Bs differ by gauge transformation. And a gauge transformation, so that's this expression that uh, the Bs differ by gauge transformation, the parameter of the gauge transformation C is itself a connection, but of one less form degree. So it's a P minus one form U1 connection. So it's an inductive definition where you sort of work your way down. Now you want to express this P minus one form connection. You also have to, have to do an open cover and, and blah, blah. And it bottoms out at one form connection, which you already know what it is, but you might even let it bottom out at a zero form connection and just say that a zero form U1 connection is just a map to U1. So when we go all the way to the end, our constant 
you know, our, our, our zero form gauge transformations are just given by maps to U1. So there is such a connection. So there's there, I didn't write it here. So there, there exists some B, some uh, D plus one form connection on D plus on S D plus two, such that DB is the volume form. And we're going to take the spherically symmetrical one. And the spherically symmetrical one is going to define the very connection of this theory when we study it at large values of this parameter h. OK, so how do we see that? Um, it's pretty simple. So if, so if h is very, very large, then the field, it wants to point in the direction of h. Or maybe there's a sign here. Maybe it wants to point it, whatever. If it wants to point in the direction of h, so we can expand the field as, as h plus a little bit. And this little bit delta phi is going to be a gapped fluctuation. And the, the mass squared of this is going to be of order the size of h. So if h is very, very large, the corrections of these gapped fluctuations is controlled. And essentially, we have that the effective action for sigma is is just some slightly renormalized um, original action that we are, that we had, where the stiffness now is going to be given by h. But in particular, it's going to have the same West amino witten term, which now I've written as this uh, holonomy of B. And that's exactly the term we were looking for um, in the effective action to say that there is a, there is a higher Berry connection. I'm sorry, getting now, lost. What is yes. sigma here? Because there's no sigma. It's effective. Oh, sorry, sigma. sigma here, right, right, right. There's no sigma here. So yeah. Um, so we're taking h, which is a parameter, and expressing it as a function now, which depends on both space and time. Okay. So we can think about. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, I just want to distinguish between the the map to parameter space and then the coordinate on parameter space itself. But this time is, is uh, yeah, so uh, this time is just one of D plus one coordinates, right? It's not- Yeah, yeah, that's right. So it's so, an so. extra to the end. Because in quantum mechanics, you had one dimensional- No, I don't, I don't add anything. This is, yeah, this is okay. simply a map to- um, Okay. To S D plus two. And this, this is the one, okay. you know, sitting inside, inside this H space where it's just a sphere of some very large radius. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Cool. So um, yes, we have this term in the, in the effective action for Sigma and we can encounter this term in the adiabatic expansion, just like with the, uh, just like with the, the, the quantum mechanical Berry phase, but it's going to be order D plus one in derivatives it's not the leading term in the adiabatic expansion anymore. We really have to see how, in this case, we're looking at the partition function rather than the phase of the wave function, but we really have to see how the system responds to a parameter that is varying both in time and space, and it has to be varying in all the coordinates. So it's not leading in the adiabatic expansion, but it is quantized. There are, there are churn numbers associated to this. In this case, the churn number is going to be the West amino witten level, K. And these quantized terms are enough for us to protect diabolical points. So they're enough for us to constrain these phase diagrams. Why is it not the leading one? I didn't understand this point. Well, just because it's order D plus one in derivatives. You could imagine something that is just order one in derivatives, but depends on the metric, right? That uh, That depends on the volume of space, for instance. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you have a, if you have a ferromagnet, right, a lattice of spin one halves, then you kind of have like, you have a, you have a buried connection that is like the volume times the, um, the buried connection that we had previously. So there are these like non-topological terms that are gonna be in the adiabatic expansion and the topological ones, you have to have as many derivatives as space-time coordinates just to write a form of the right degree. 
So if I understand correctly, you are focusing on, on some particular term in, uh, in the expression for the partition function of this linear sigma model as, yes. as, as a function of this background field sigma. Exactly. And, and you're saying there's going to be always this term, okay, this, this, this term that you wrote and, okay. And uh, yeah, now you, yeah, I don't, yeah, now I, I realize, now I agree with you that you say that there are also other terms, but now what's going to happen? How are you going to focus on this term as opposed to the other terms? This is something that I didn't, don't clearly see yet. Yes. Well, as long as this, um, as long as this effective action is well defined, so as, so as long as we're in, um, a nice enough region, say where we have a gap, and the gap is uh, maybe uniformly bounded from below. Then, then all of the terms in S effective should depend kind of smoothly on other parameters. So, if we vary J, for instance, or we break the space, if we break the spherical symmetry, we we dimple our target space somewhat. Then, S effective should be should be smooth, and uh, when it's not smooth is when we're going to have interesting things in the phase diagram like diabolical points. So if I were to draw the phase diagram as a function of H at some fixed J and some non-zero K, so now this is a picture happening in, in this H space. So on some large sphere, there's a trivial phase. But with with a with a Berry connection, and it can't just be trivial inside. If it were trivial inside, it would mean that this higher form connection, which is defined on this sphere, extends to the ball inside of it. But because it has some non-zero churn number, that can't happen. So even though we might not understand the dynamics at small h, maybe at h equals zero, as a function of j, we know that we know that there has to be there has to be something going on here. It can't just be completely trivial phase inside. So this is this is like a diabolical point, but where you know, there could be an island of a phase. I'll show you some examples of diabolical points. It's, it's a little bit like, and as we tune J, the stiffness parameter, the nature of this locus inside can change. We can even break the spherical symmetry. It won't, it won't change the Berry number out here, although it might change the form of the connection. You'll get, uh, you might get different diabolical loci inside, but you always have to have something. So it's a bit reminiscent of an anomaly if you like. So an anomaly when you have a global symmetry implies that you can't have a trivial ground state. But here we don't assume any kind of symmetry to get this conclusion. So here's, here's an example, uh, you know, more detailed example of the, of the same example, uh, which is that in, in one plus one dimensions, there's, there's some critical parameter values where we get a CFT. And the CFT we get is this SU2 level one theory, the central charge one CFT. And so the phase diagram, if we like, it has this, it has this single point. And so now D is one, so now we're inside R4. The normal directions of this point correspond to four particular uh, relevant operators of the CFT. And that turns out to be the, so the CFT has SO4 symmetry. We can identify what H couples to as this SO4 vector of, of lightest vertex operators in the theory. So I often use this compact boson notation with the two dual circle fields. And there are these four vertex operators that transform as an SO4 vector. And those give you the normal directions of this point, but it's not a generic, this is not a generic phase diagram because 
we can add, if we, if we deform this a little bit, like if we, if we break the SO4 symmetry, then, so the SO4 symmetry here is acting by rotations in this R4, and so it fixes the origin. But if we break this symmetry, say we add some other vertex operator. So we can add this, uh, these charge two vertex operators and they're marginally relevant. And if we do that, this diabolical locus will, will turn into something else. And it turns out what we get is we get a, so if I do this right, we get a three-dimensional ball inside of this S4 where there's, there's a two-fold degenerate state on this three-dimensional ball. So this is co-dimension one. So it looks a bit like a first order line, although it's happening in four dimensions. So it's a first order um, three cycle. It's not a cycle, it has boundary. The boundary is on some two dimensional sphere where we have this C equals half Ising CFT. And this diabolical locus is generic. So it's kind of funny, like now we're moving in higher dimensions, we're no longer going to get points. Uh, generically speaking, we're going to be getting these weird sort of blobs and other kinds of shapes that are nonetheless protected. So you can, you can tell this, uh, this doesn't have any particular symmetry. None of these theories have anomalies. The Isaac CFT doesn't have any anomalies. Nonetheless, it, it occurs inside this, uh, this big three-dimensional sphere surrounding it, and there's no way to get rid of it. You can change it, but you can't get rid of it. Well, so here's a, yeah. That this, this more general situation on the right is, is really a generic, seems to be a very strong statement. That's right, that's right. I'll, I'll say a little bit more about uh, what, what generic should mean. Okay. Kind of like. Yeah, actually, I'm sorry, but I, I'm still, <laughs> I'm still not fully, uh, yeah, I'm still a bit confused about uh, this uh, very connection for field theory because you know quantum mechanics example was nice and easy and familiar but then um you reformulate it in terms of the effective action and then you know the thing that i didn't understand is that you know for quantum mechanics we could think in terms of the effective action but we could also think in terms of this phase of the wave function and you know, arguably this phase of the wave function is kind of more down to earth and also easier to compute things concretely. But for the field theory, uh, is this second interpretation of this um, very connection, is it available? Can we, can we think it, of this mm -hmm. some sort of phase of the ground state? I don't, I don't know, yeah. The field it, it is available. It is available, although um, it restricts the sort of space times you can study. So if we take if we take x, oops, if we take x to be, you know, some space y times maybe s one time, mm -hmm. then we can certainly consider consider maps to s s d plus two and uh, what's going on here. Um, Right, so so there will be some holonomy associated to this, right? So we can there will there will be some, whoops, if we uh, you know b is a d plus one form, right? There's some holonomy associated to this map. This is sigma. I believe that that holonomy has the same interpretation as as the you have some ground state on y, but now you have spatially varying parameters, so you have to have the ground state as a function of the spatially varying parameters. And then you also vary the parameter in time and you see how the phase of this wave function transforms. I believe that you can see that from the partition function point of view because the, it's a gaps theory. And so the, you can see how the ground state is going to be the most important um, contribution to the partition function. And then probably get the, get the same conclusion studying that. It's not a big limitation because, as you said, you know all your examples that you give on in on the next pages they refer to flat space, so we don't actually care about some very complicated manifolds X Dewey. 
That's right. We we don't we don't really care. The the connection itself is kind of is kind of um, it should be locally defined. That's the point of this effective action: is that you get you get local terms, local expressions um, on X. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Sorry. Maybe I can also ask yeah. a, a simple question. So, what would happen if you seem to have a target space that is a sphere that is one dimension lower than your space time dimension, right? One higher. One higher, sorry. Yeah. So what happens if you just consider an arbitrary sphere? So you have an x d plus one to s p. So uh, you don't even have to consider spheres. You can consider any space, any space that uh, has a d plus one form connections on it. Um, can um, be the parameter space of some theory with a Berry phase, or it can be the parameter space of a, uh, you know, it, like, it can be the subset of parameter space where the system is say in a trivial phase. Right. So, so that's I fine, guess you but need you need to, to have, you need to have uh, D plus two cycles. So, so these yeah. D plus one form connections is sim very similar to line bundles. It's classified by H2. These guys mm -hmm. are classified by HD plus two. So you really need to have, uh, if you want to have uh, some, some churn numbers, some higher churn numbers, um, you need to have some cohomology in degree D plus two. So most spheres are not going to work, right. actually. Yeah, I see. Only the sphere okay. will work. But other spaces can work. Yeah, as long as your HD plus two is. Yeah, tori are very useful for us, right? Um, yeah, uh -huh. Your favorite target space. I see. OK, mm -hmm. thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. I do spheres because it's kind of like easy to draw spheres. And some things are sphere specific and I'll point that out. Okay, so there, there's also a free, there's also uh, free fermion versions of the same family that realize other sorts of diabolical points or other sorts of diabolical loci. Um, let me not say too much about this example in the interest of time. But if you have two complex fermions, then there are many there are many different mass terms that you can write. But if you write these four specific mass terms, one is the usual SU two symmetric mass term, and the other one are these chiral mass terms that that transform as a as SU two adjoint, then we again get a four dimensional space where you turn on any combination of these mass terms, you get a trivial phase, and there's going to be a higher vary phase with Turn number one on this on this boundary, and this is an example where you can compute the partition function exactly and show that you get um, this term, in the effective action. But if you turn on other mass terms, the diabolical point will change. You want to just have this single point at the origin, and you'll produce something like we had before, where you'll have a, you'll have a two dimensional sphere, but it won't be the boundary of anything. You just get a two-dimensional sphere and you can perturb it further. I think you can get rings in this example. So what makes a phase diagram generic? Roughly speaking, if, if we have our phase diagram, uh, what do we mean? Uh, we, have, we have a system that depends on all these parameters and we get the phase diagram by labeling every parameter value by the infrared fixed point that it flows to. So what the, what the phase diagram is, is a, is a collection of, of subspaces labeled by IR fixed points. And if we turn on some generic perturbation, you expect that it will be some, at any point, you know, turn, turn on some generic perturbation everywhere in the phase diagram. At each point, it'll look like a roughly generic perturbation. And so you expect that if there are any relevant operators that are not already accounted for in the phase diagram, that these things will just disappear. So for instance, if this loop, if the, if the boundary, if the, if the IR fixed point here say has two relevant operators, only, only one combination of them can be this normal direction. And if we perturb by the other relevant operator, we should be able to get rid of it. So roughly speaking, a generic phase diagram is one where the co-dimension 
of all of these strata is equal to the number of relevant operators. There are some caveats about marginally relevant operators and things like that, but this is roughly what we're talking about. So for instance, sometimes you get uh, totally generic looking things with, with or no topological reason. For instance, if you have a two parameter phase diagram, you can certainly have a first order line, you know, where you have twofold degeneracy ending at some, ending at some Ising point. So this is totally generic because this Ising CFD has two relevant operators. So let's say D, you know, D equals one or two or something. So in general, what we're doing is you can think about there as being kind of this abstract space of, of all the effective field theories that you could have, or maybe of, of all of the systems that you're interested in. And so this would be like the universal phase diagram. You label all of those, all of those objects by their IR fixed points. If it's the space of effective field theories, then you really have a flow. You really have RG flow in this whole space. And we're getting a stratification by the attractive basins in this flow. And a generic phase diagram is a slice through this space, which is transverse to all of the strata. Now it's a really wonky looking stratification. It's very far from like any kind of nice mathematical stratification, but nonetheless, we can say that the generic phase diagram is a transversal slice. So we're only gonna hit things of finite co-dimension. We're only gonna hit things of co-dimension K if we have K uh, coordinates, you know, K parameters to tune to get to them. So what we're, what we're doing when we find these higher very phases is these are, these are giving us non-contractible cycles in these strata. So this is, because this gives you an effective field theory on that part of the cycle, which does not extend to the same theory on the inside. Like it does not smoothly extend to a target space that fills in that cycle. So that cycle is actually non-contractible in this stratum. And so far we've only discussed the stratum of the trivial phase, which is an open stratum. There's no relevant operators, so it's co-dimension zero. Phases, by the way, are all, op the open strata are the phases. And these diabolical loci, they're, they're lower dimensional strata, right? Higher co-dimension that punch holes, they punch topological holes in, in the bigger strata. So that's what's going on in, in these funny looking pictures where you have the diabolical point in the middle. That's really like the stratum of this diabolical point. It's like punching a hole through the other stratum. So that's just sort of inspir inspirational. It's not really useful. Um, so I think I alluded to this before the to go back to this question of uh, quantization of the Berry number um, to kind of motivate boundaries, the, the Berry number over, now I'm gonna to stick to a spherical cycle. So this argument is really for spheres. The Berry number is going to be captured by the winding number of the partition function around a particular family of sphere partition functions. So if we, if we look at the partition function on, uh, spherical space-time doesn't really have to be a spherical space-time. We can do something with wave functions, but let me do a spherical sp space-time. And let me have this parameter field sigma depend on an S1 coordinate S so that this whole map has degree one. And let me also do it so that, so that sigma zero equals sigma one are constant. Then what will happen is that you know, for every S, this will be, say it's in a trivial phase, it's some, some non-zero number if S is slowly, very slowly varying, sorry, if sigma is very slowly varying, but the phase of this will wind. And you can, you can see that winding in the phase from this term in the effective action. And in this picture, I've drawn an example of, of such a family where at S equals zero and S equals one, your parameter value is just say here at the south pole of the sphere, and then as you increase S, the space time is traversing larger and larger spheres, which end up wrapping all the way around and then becoming smaller and then uh, going back to the constant at the end. So this is a loop of, of partition functions so that Z 
s equals zero equals z x s equals one. The parameter fields themselves are just equal, loose together. So we get a well-defined winding number. And the winding number has to be quantized just because it's a number. This kind of argument is a lot more delicate on non-spherical cycles. I'll just mention that. Don't know how to do this kind of argument. But what it shows is that if you have a boundary and what a boundary is going to be is, a, is a, let's say that a boundary is, the boundary condition should be defined for all the parameter values. So let's say, let's say we have such a boundary condition, then it means that we can take our partition functions and now we can also define them on space times with this, with this boundary condition. And they will depend on maps sigma uh, that are just maps from X into the parameter space. And now we can unwind families. So this, so this spherical family, this family of sphere partition functions, if, if instead it's a family of, of ball partition functions, the winding number is no longer well-defined. And now I can create a two parameter family where in, in one of the parameters S it's doing like what we had before. It's, it's trying to wrap around the sphere, but in the other parameter R, we're kind of pulling the, we're using the boundary to pull it off of the sphere at the same time. So the result is that at S equals, what did I say here? At S equals one, this map has degree one. This parameter map will factor through the map to the sphere and it'll have degree one. But at, uh, at R equals zero, it'll have degree zero. And so the winding number changes. So the only way for the winding number of the phase to change is for the phase to not be well-defined at some point. In other words, for the partition function to vanish. And we ascribe this to a place where the boundary physics is not smooth, where there's some, some change in the boundary physics that, that you have a vanishing of the partition function. And that's going to happen along some, along some locus here on this sphere, or maybe it happens in some positive dimensional locus, maybe it just happens at some points, such that when you pull the boundary over this diabolical locus, that's where the partition function is going to vanish. And what we learn from generalizing this argument is that our phase diagram is gonna look like this. We're gonna have some, we're gonna have some bulk diabolical points. I don't know, maybe there's three of them here. Um, Actually, I already drew one here. So this red point inside the sphere is supposed to be a bulk diabolical point. And we're also gonna, for any choice of boundary condition, there's going to be a boundary diabolical locus, which ends on the bulk diabolical locus. So we're gonna get these sort of strings, right? They might connect up pairs or they might run off to infinity or they can be more complicated shapes, but they have to end on the, they can only end on the bulk diabolical locus. And the rule is that the complement of all of these guys, so the complement of the, of the bulk points and also these, uh, these boundary points, that, that, that the Berry connection has to be trivial there, or it has to be, it has to have zero Berry, Berry numbers. So this, these boundary diabolical points, they pop all of the non-contractible cycles in the phase diagram. And it should remind you, it should remind you of vile semi-metals if you know about Fermi arcs, that's, that's the statement that when you have quantum mechanical diabolical points in a band structure, that when you study your material with boundary, you get, you get curves of uh, boundary states, um, you know, metallic sort of Fermi arcs um, of boundary states connecting the vial nodes. So this is like the field theory version of that. Good, so here's an example, um, back to the fermion. So the, so the fermion theory is nice because um, we can compute all sorts of things. In particular, uh, there's a nice class of boundary conditions which are, which are defined by interfaces. So what we can do is we can say that we have to um, always kind of declare what, which trivial phase we're going to consider a boundary to, if you like. Or we can just say that we're going to create a boundary by having the system at some parameter value. And then for all X less than zero, we're gonna, we're gonna tune the parameters to this 
some some fixed parameter value where the mass is is positive, say, and the and the ends these uh, chiral masses are zero, and then the actual boundary condition will be like the choices of these interfaces. So if you like, if we draw the if we draw the phase diagram, there's the diabolical point. We're going to choose some point to be um, to be the trivial phase. That's going to be this point. And then our system, we're going to have some bulk parameter value here. And then along the boundary, we're going to have some interface that connects them. And you can already sort of see from this picture that as the, as the bulk parameter, the blue dot starts to wander around, this loop is going to get, uh, it's going to get stuck on the diabolical point. And in this system, that exactly happens when we have a, when we have a domain wall that goes from so here's some positive m to negative m, and let's say n equals n equals zero everywhere. Then this is this is the famous problem that was studied by Jakiv and Rebbe. Right, so you forget about this term. You just have a you just have a massive domain wall. Then what you get in the Hilbert space of this theory is you get you get two localized modes on the wall. Let me call them psi up and psi down, which are two complex zero modes. So this, this theory of this interface has a fourfold degeneracy. It has, it has four states of, of the lowest energy, depending on how you occupy these states. And this fourfold degeneracy on the boundary, we can, we're going to consider this as, a, as this is our boundary diabolical locus. So for, so for values of m that are less than zero and n which are zero that's like choosing a path that cuts right across going through this diabolic point and now we ask what happens when we turn n back on so we start to perturb this blue point a little bit well we can actually study that perturbatively in these zero modes so if i write the four states of the zero mode or even this like chemistry notation so there's like there's there's a empty singlet and then there's then there's um, then there's a there's a there's a SE2 doublet here, and then there's then there's a filled singlet. And what you find when you turn back on N is that it acts as a magnetic field for this uh, for this effective um, spin. And what it's going to do is it's going to favor these states with non-zero spin, and they're going to polarize in the direction of the field, which is N. You see there are three Ns. So it's just like a field. And if we compute, if we compute the Berry phase of N sort of perturbatively for this interface system, we find exactly the Berry phase example in quantum mechanics. So we have this fun correspondence where here's our, here's our bulk um, diabolical point where on some sphere linking it, we have, we have a Berry number you know, Berry phase with turn number, whatever it is, n. Then with boundary, we're going to get some curve. Sort of near that curve, if we look at spheres that are that are near the curve, then we can kind of work perturbatively in just the boundary degrees of freedom. We can forget about the bulk, and what we'll find in that case is that there's that there's a boundary Berry number. And that is also equal to n. So, so this is the bulk of boundary correspondence. Now, the reason why this is legal, this cycle here is contractible, right? You can contract it. You can pull it over this big sphere. But you can't pull it over the big sphere without, you know, we forgot about the bulk. And we sort of integrated out the bulk in order to define this Berry number. So we did something somewhat illegal that once this sphere is large, we, it really comes back to bite us. and the the winding numbers are actually all zero once you consider the bulk and the boundary together. And that is what allows you to unlink this sphere. Cool. So let me see. Um, yeah, in the, in the remaining few minutes, let me just quickly say what happens when you add symmetries. So symmetries are pretty easy to add, actually. So 
if, if we have a global symmetry that acts at every point in parameter space, meaning that we're only going to study symmetric perturbations, then we can couple to a background gauge field. And terms for the background gauge field will also appear in the effective action. And there will be terms that couple the parameter fields to the background gauge fields. And so these are sort of uh, invariants of now G symmetric families. And the example of an example of such a term, if we're in one plus one dimensions, where our parameter space is a circle, we can have a term that, and maybe maybe G is E1, we can, we can have a term that couples the gauge field A to the winding density, D sigma. And what this tells us is that if we, if we say wind around the target space once in the time direction, so let's, let's, consider, let's consider a torus, if we wind wind around S1 in the time direction, then and say we don't vary the parameters spatially, then this integral is going to split. This is going to be a time integral, sorry, a space integral of A, and then the time integral d sigma. So this part is just going to be one, and we're going to be left with this term. Which is a, which is a charge Q Wilson line, which stretches across the system. And the interpretation of this is that varying the parameter in the circle pumps Q units of charge, of U one charge across the system. So this family is is a quantized charge pump. This is this known as the Thales charge pump. And this can, this gives us another simple picture of why we have boundary diabolical loci. Because if this S1 family is occurring outside of some diabolical point, then if we have a boundary and we go around the cycle, we're going to pump charge and charge is going to accumulate at the boundary. And so you can't have a smooth boundary because the, because the charge at the ground, the charge of the, at the boundary is going to change. So you have to have some level crossing somewhere. And that level crossing is going to be where this boundary diabolical locus is. So it's going to be, it's going to look like two states of opposite charge crossing in energy. Okay, and you can do that with the fermion and you can, you can classify these things. So let me, um, I think let me, let me end there and I'll end on this, uh, on this sort of question slide, I think. So, I didn't tell you about the classification, but you can sort of guess from like these terms that we were writing that it's easy to it's easy to classify these terms using using cohomology. Can we construct can we construct all of the families in the classification? That's one question. I think the answer to that is yes, although we don't know how to do it in general. Then a question is uh, for those families, what do some of the diabolical loci look like? We wonder also if there are topologically non-trivial families which are not captured by the effective action. So there's some indications from lattice constructions that there might be more general kinds of thalus pumps that I don't know how to express as an effective action. So that would be interesting to understand. And uh, also in this talk, I only talked about the trivial phase. So cycles in, the, in that component, but for topologically ordered phases, you can do things involving anions. If you have ground state degeneracy, there are these vacuum crossing phenomena where you go around a cycle and the ground states get permuted. Or if you have a gap, gapless phase, then I don't even know what the possibilities are. So that's all very interesting. And yeah, let me, let me end there. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, can I ask one? Sure, yeah, Joseph, please. go ahead. Um, so the parameter space that you consider in, in principle, say if you have a field theory, you can couple the parameter to any operator, right? That's right. So you have an infinite dimensional space. And yes, but, but most of them are going to be irrelevant, right? Irrelevant in the RG sense or? In the RG sense. 
and you only need to look at the relevant ones for this. Well, the idea is that if you if you have n parameters, then theories with k relevant operators are going to appear along n minus k dimensional subspaces of your of your phase diagram for these n parameters. So when you're studying when you're studying uh, generic perturbations, then you can't control which operator you're a coupling to. If you have symmetries, then you can. I mean, this is often an issue for studying systems on the lattice that you know, we know we, want, we flow to some CFT. We want to study some specific CFT operator. It can be hard to isolate it. If you just write down some perturbation that breaks all of the symmetries, then usually it's uh, just some generic combination of all of the operators. I, see. I don't know if that does that answer your question. Yeah, yeah, I see. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the kind of space that I tried to talk about with with this stratification, this universal space, is like it's maybe not well defined. Maybe only slices through it are well defined. It might only be like a, a mathematical abstraction, but it can be. I don't know. We can sort of study it co-dimension by co-dimension. So I think this is a nice program, um, maybe for. I don't know, for CFT people to study. Yeah, CFTs with small number of relevant operators, I think are especially interesting. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, maybe I'll ask, uh, uh, what happens if you impose uh, any kind of supersymmetry? constraint on the theory? Does it uh, simplify you know, or, I don't know, or makes more complex your analysis? What would happen? Uh, yeah, so I don't, think, I don't think I'm qualified to answer that question, but I think it's an interesting question. There are some, there are some papers. I think David Tong has a paper about uh, where you get some kind of supersymmetric Berry connection, but it's the quantum mechanical Berry connection. Mm -hmm. And it's related to like these TT star equations, and you get like a supersymmetric monopole. You get some kind of a super connection. I'm not exactly sure. It's been a long time since I tried to look at that. What I don't know is whether supersymmetry, you know, can it can it enter into the story the way that other global symmetries do? Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure about that. It'd be really interesting. It'd be really interesting to know. Okay. Like you can't couple to gauge fields, right? All right. So that's my usual trick. You couple to gauge fields, study the uh, uh, effective gauge theory. But it still uh, restricts the perturbations which are available to you. So probably it gives you some special, um, some special families which are not generic without supersymmetry. Sorry, why can't you couple to gauge fields? Uh, for the supersymmetry generator? Well, because it has a spin index. But we do that in supergravity. You couple to the gravity you now, which is like a, a spin three half gauge field. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But I don't, I mean, maybe this is just uh, my ignorance. I don't know how to think about that as like a connection on some bundle. And like In the sense, this answer, one has to deal with the supergravity and more generally gravity, right? It's not a QFT anymore something different yeah but is it okay if it's just background super gravity because i don't want i don't ever want to make this gauge field dynamical then like all kinds of uncontrolled things will happen mm -hmm. i don't know maybe maybe there's a way to do that i'm sure people have studied uh topological terms that you can write in super gravity and then you could ask if these are associated to like supersymmetry protected topological phases or something, you know, um, and then you would add parameters. Yeah, there should so be I know a in Susie theories you have. Mm. Sorry, go ahead. And there should be a supersymmetric version of the gravitational Chern Simon, for example. Yes, yeah, for example. Yeah. Mm. And then you should have something like, okay, so there are families that are, so the theta angle is, a, is an interesting S1 family where as you, as you, if you have a 4D theory with a theta angle and you go around the, you go around the, the theta, it's like you pump a Chern-Simons term to the boundary. 
right? Because theta equals two pi can be written as D of the trans Simons term. So that's also kind of like a Thalbus pump. And yeah, so you could have a super, super symmetric version of that. But I also wonder like, you know, in the SUSY like theories, you often have interesting moduli spaces of CFTs. So moduli spaces are sort of rare in CFTs, generally speaking, to my understanding. But yeah, so maybe you want to study like the connections, naturally defined connections on this moduli space in this kind of like very framework. And normally you need like adiabaticity. So you need some, you need some gap in order to have the adiabatic expansion make sense, but maybe you don't need that in a supersymmetric theory. Maybe like you can make sense of it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, maybe I would like to ask you a question about something quite old. One of the first occurrences of topological terms in uh, condensed matter physics was this uh, beautiful Halden conjecture, which was eventually uh, proved and uh, relating the um, uh, possibility to, to have a uh, alternance between half and half and uh, integer spin uh, chains, the half integer chains be, being critical and uh, integer chains being massive, uh, would you have a, a, a new perspective on, on this uh, old problems of uh, spin chains with, with this approach in terms of uh, double equal point in these parameter uh, spaces? Yeah, so thanks, that's, that's, a, that's a really good question. I believe that what you, what you are getting in, in that case is for any spin, You'll get you'll get some Berry number at some at some large value of the polarizing field. So okay. basically, you'll, you'll still have this uh, um, large three dimensional sphere where you polarize the system. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you what happens at the origin, which is where the Haldane conjecture happens, right? Okay. But I can tell you that there's got to be something going on inside the sphere, and I believe what what will happen. If we if we preserve if we preserve the um, let me get a little drawing thing here yeah so we have this large sphere and then say we're in the integer spin case mm -hmm. maybe spin one then with this um, if you preserve spin symmetry for instance then then you'll get some some topological phase in the inside, mm -hmm. which we know is a different phase mm -hmm. from far away. And so the diabolical locus here will be some, some gapless points along a, along a two-dimensional sphere, mm -hmm. separating this sort of island of the phase inside from outside. Okay. But I can't tell you that this happens. I can just tell you that if it's gapped, then there must be some gapless points sort of nearby. I see, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a good question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I also have a related question. Uh, so, okay, so uh, um, if one can summarize all this story from some practical perspective is that you, you, you found this very nice way to show that something non-trivial happens inside from doing some relatively simple calculations, at least for you, okay, I'm not sure I understand to the point that I could repeat it myself, but at, at large fields where things are under control. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and so for example, you know, we know that some theories have massless, have CFT, have TFTs, other theories are massive. So some of these cases you can explain using this new, way of understanding things, right? Mm -hmm. But, 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 you know, what I didn't quite understand is that, you know, presumably not every CFT, not the existence of every CFT can be explained using uh, this method. So presumably there are some other massless fixed points, some other material fixed points that have some dynamical origin but cannot be explained in terms of finding some deformation with non-trivial very, uh, very uh, 
phase at infinity at some large deforming field. So could you mm -hmm. like could you say like which fixed points one could hope to explain using this mechanism and which not? Like do we know a priori? Uh, yeah, how, what is your point of view on this? Like yeah, for that's, example, that's easing, a, easing yeah. the fact that the easing CFT, the fact that the the phi to the fourth theory in 3D has a second order phase transition and not first order phase transition. It's a non-trivial fact. Could you ever hope to explain this fact using this sort of tricks, or is it like not topological and so hence cannot be explained this in this way? Right. So I th think there's a number of things to say about this. Um, so there's there's the nearby like any CFT we can define the nearby phase diagram, which is which is this we just consider it with as many parameters as we have relevant operators, and we just draw everything that happens near this point. And in each of those nearby phases and maybe phase boundaries, you can you can sort of study the topology of of uh, if you like, you draw a sphere around the point and you look at the link of the phase diagram. And if you have topology there, then you can, you can, you can hope to have some, some very phase, something like the Ising CFT does not have that. Yeah. The nearby phase diagram of the Ising CFT looks like this, where you have the CFT at this point in this first order line. There's no topology going on out here. If you look at this link, it's just an, an interval and a point, and at least the methods that I told you, there's no sort of smooth component with any topology. Maybe you might like to say that the jump here is topologically protected. That's well, kind of could try to statement. add complex magnetic field, maybe, I don't know. Mm. That's true. It still, still, uh, still doesn't help. You can't close the circle. Right. Yeah. But I think what can happen in these situations is that uh, you might not even be guaranteed this gapless point inside. Like you can always have, you can always have what, what you're studying be kind of occluded by another phase, which is just separated by a first order transition, right? Like you might have some really interesting looking phase diagram, you know, with, with some nearby phases, right? But all of it, you might not see any of it because there's just this island of something else of lower energy with a first order boundary. So it could be everything here is, is like gapped. And I don't know how to rule those things out. I think that in the space of diabolical lo loci, like there will be gapless points always. Like I do think that if you have topology out here in this nearby phase diagram, that there's some way you can get rid of this island to reveal the critical point. But that's like, that's like a belief that comes from kind of like an aesthetic uh, perspective. I don't know how you would argue it, mm -hmm. but this really gets into the details of like hard problems. Like you said, usually find, determining whether a transition is continuous or not is usually a very hard problem. Yeah. Okay, no, still seems to be very powerful trick. Yeah. I yeah. think it's like a nice way of thinking, like to think about the, uh, to think about the whole phase diagram and sort of try to think about the constraints of genericness. Yeah. I would, I would advocate the way of thinking above the techniques. So anyone else questions last round, the bar's closing. Well, if not, let's thank Ryan again for a beautiful talk. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me.